Open your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 28 this morning. We're going to continue on with steward, um, kingdom stewardship. But what I'm going to speak about today is kingdom stewardship and action. What you see here is the action of being a good steward over God's will and God's plan for this church and for our lives. God has called us to reach people. And that's the, that's the driving force. It's the center of gravity for our church. Amen. First Chronicles chapter 28. Let me hear a great big amen if you're there. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Father, once again I come into your presence and I ask you, Father, to anoint me. I know your word is anointed, but anoint me, your servant, God, to be able to articulate your word in a way that would provoke, inspire, and challenge your people. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. And the church says, amen. Hey, once again, it's great to have all of the, the gifts that are here. Um, you guys are at home. We're family, amen? amen. Great big family. I want to read the scripture. Dick Mills gave us this promise scripture uh, many, many years ago when we had him at the church, and he gave us this word. Um, prior to that, I'm going to read verses 9 and 10, then we're going to get to our promise scripture. So, First uh, Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9 says, And you, my son Solomon. Now David is at the end of his life. He's already placed Solomon as king, and he's about to go home to be with the Lord. He's about to pass away. Um, He's fulfilled his mission on earth. In the book of Acts, it says that after David fulfilled God's plan for his life and his generation, uh, he fell asleep, which means he died, he passed on. So he's giving his son uh, wisdom and advice as he's taking the kingdom. and He's about to build the temple. And he says, and you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father. How many know we need we need? Great exampleship. Amen, leaders? The God of your father and serve him. I love this part. And serve him with a whole hearted devotion. With a whole hearted devotion. And with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And then he tells Solomon in verse 10, think about this. He says, consider, which means to think. Give careful thought to in the Hebrew. Now, for the Lord has chosen you. The Lord has chosen you. I want everybody to tell your neighbor, God has chosen you. Come on. God has chosen you. For the Lord has chosen you to build a temple as a sanctuary, be strong and do the work. Victor R. H. Whittier, God has chosen us to build a strong, thriving, growing church. We're not just aimlessly wandering around trying to find a vision. We have a vision. We have our international vision, and then we got the vision of the house, and that's to build a strong, thriving, growing church. It's to continue to plant churches. See, if we're, how are we going to help the international movement if we're not a strong, thriving church? That's why we got to be strong. That's why we got to knock down walls. That's why we got to keep growing because we have a mandate from God. We have a calling on our lives, each and every one of you. You're part of something great. Tell your neighbor you're part of something great. You're part of something great. We got vision. We got purpose. See, this morning, we're full of this vitamin. And I'm not talking about vitamin A, B. We're full of vitamin PV. You know what that is? Purpose and vision. Come on. Some of you need a little bit more PV vitamin. We have a purpose. Remember before you got saved when you had no purpose? You'd wake up and have to go to the liquor store to get another 40 or you'd have to go to the connection. You had nothing going for you. How many of you remember where God picked you up from? See, but now, now we got vision. We got purpose. We have a reason to wake up. We're going somewhere. You're part of something great. Tell your neighbor you're a part of this. Okay, let's continue on. <laughs> now let's go over and let's get to our promise scripture so we can start the message this morning. 
Verse 20. I love how it says here, David also said. So David's been in a long conversation with Solomon. And now he tells Solomon this. And God is speaking to us today. For your personal lives, for your personal lives, for your family, your grandchildren, your future, and for this church. David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous. That's heavy that he would tell him to be strong and courageous. In other words, he was trying to tell him, you're never going to be able to, to lead this nation. You're never going to be able to build this temple. You're never going to be able to do the work of God unless you purpose in your heart to be strong in the Lord. See, the strength he's talking about is not physical strength. The strength he's talking about is a strength that can only come from the presence of God. The strength he's talking about comes from relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness in the house? The strength that we have to do what we do is because we love our Lord and we are a grateful people. Can I get a witness in the house? Is there anybody remember where God picked you up from? Is there anybody here that remembers when you were messed up and you were hurting and you were lost? But we ain't lost no more. We ain't hurting no more. Now we're the people and we are the army of God. Are you here? We're the army of God. He's saying, Solomon, you got to be strong. Not a physical strength. It's a spiritual strength. See, this is not a natural thing we're involved in. This is a spiritual thing. And then he says, be courageous. Have courage because you're going to go through some attacks. You're going to go through some trouble. Isn't it interesting how God uses trouble in our lives? I was talking to a leader the other day. And he was telling me about all the trouble he's going through. Or they're going through. Because you never know if it's a man or a woman. I'm not saying that in a weird way. What I mean by I don't want you to know who it was. <laughs> Try to figure it out. <laughs> not that we have weird, you know, you know. Let me rephrase it. Let me communicate it right. <laughs> okay. And so this person was communicating the fire and the trials and the hardship. And I always let people, when they do that, I, let it, I, I, I just let them spill it out and talk about it. But inside my mind, I'm like happy and jumping up and down. And I used to tell people that, and they, they get hurt. But I, what I realized, the reason why I get happy is because it shows me that God's at work in that person's life. I've learned in my life that God uses trouble to mold and shape us. God uses pain to correct us, to direct us, to instruct us, and to give us safety in our lives because we learn. Don't touch the iron, it's hot. Can I get a witness? See, I've learned a long time ago that God uses those things. When God has a calling on your life, and everybody here, God has a calling on your life. There's a plan and purpose. That's why you got to go through some trouble. That's why you got to go through some hard times. That's why. Because God is at work in your life. You are under construction, just like this building. God is instructing in your life. God is working in your life because you're going to help us build a mega church. We can't do it with a bunch of little... Spiritual sissies. <laughs> so he says, hey, Solomon. See, David's remembering back when God anointed him to be king. And nothing happened and he had to go back out and take care of the sheep. And then he got called into the service of Saul to play the harp. And then God raised him up to be in the army of Saul. And then the people start, God started giving him victory. And then he remembers back when the people were singing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands. And all of a sudden, one day he's playing the harp, and Saul throws a javelin at him and almost takes his head off. Then David remembers when he fled and had to go in a cave. But what happened to the calling of God? What happened to the anointing of God? What happened to the blessing of God? Well, it was all part of the process that God was taking David through. That's why after David built his palace... That we know that when he built his, outside of his room, 
He did it southwest towards the cave of Adullam. So when he would walk out of his palace from his bedroom, he would always look towards the cave of Adullam to remember where God had picked him up from. So he would never forget. And the moment David forgot, he turned the opposite direction and he seen a woman taking a bath. But if you would have stayed focused on the cave of Adullam, hallelujah, if you stay focused on what God wants to do in your life, it's going to be all right. Trouble, heartache, pain is what God uses to mold and shape an army. And God is shaping and raising up an army. Can I get a witness in the house? And David's remembering this, and he's telling his son, I know what's ahead. Yeah, there's blessings. Yes, there's great things, but there's some trouble coming. You're going to have to be a warrior, Solomon. You're going to have to be strong. Maybe Bathsheba pampered him. Because, you know, that was Solomon's mom. It was his mommy. Maybe he was a mama's boy. No offense, women, because I know how you get. <laughs> Talk about my boy. So maybe she was there just, oh, Solomon, oh. And David said, wait a minute here. Solomon, mommy can't fight all your battles. So he says, you're going to have to be strong, Solomon. You're going to have to have courage. How many times, and you could ask the pastors that are here, ask anybody that's been saved for a while, how many times have you felt like quitting or giving up? If I had a dollar for every time, I'd be a millionaire. I'd be like Donald Trump. <laughs> but you hold on with courage. Somebody say courage. 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 And then he says this. And do the work. Just do the work, man. Don't be afraid. And don't be discouraged. For the Lord my God is with you. This is the word that, that Dick Mills gave me and Doreen and gave our church, gave all of us. God is with us, and he will, not fail to, he will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple is finished. Today I want to ask you a couple questions. That's my introduction. I'm going to start the message now. Why should we keep growing? Why should you keep growing in the, as an individual? Why should we keep growing as a church? We will either step forward into growth or we'll step back into complacency. The reason why I got to keep growing is because we need to reach more people. How many of you remember when you were messed up? Okay, 10 of you. You live, then you wonder why I call you that. How many of you remember when you were messed up? See, I'm not talking about just because you had a problem with alcohol or you had a problem maybe some of you with drugs, not, not many of you, maybe one or two of you. But, but either way, without Jesus Christ in your life, it does not matter. If you were to die in your sins and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, you're messed up. And I'm talking to you. God intervened in our lives. Now we got hope. We're on our way to heaven. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's why we got to keep growing. There's other people out there, and you and I have to reach them. We're a church with the mission. We're a church with the purpose. We have a divine mandate. We have a divine calling. It's in our spiritual DNA. Every week, God brings people to our church. You know, it's shocking to me. We put on more chairs. We open this place up. Everybody look around. This place is packed out. Maybe it's true. If you build it, they'll come. <laughs> I think God, pastor came and provoked us. I couldn't sleep. You know, that night, that Sunday morning when he came, I, I went home. I couldn't sleep. And then when I tried to go to sleep, I had a dream. I'm like, ah, he's even invading my dreams. <laughs> Vision, purpose. Pastor told me one time, many, many years ago, and it's been tattooed in my heart. I'll never forget, he told me this. And I even wrote down the date. Many, many, many years ago. 
He said, to be, be effective in ministry, Joe, it means you have to stay close to the need. To be effective in ministry, because ministry is not programs. Ministry is not a building. Ministry is people. And I look across the sanctuary in the first service. I looked across the sanctuary, and I've seen so many of you over these past years that have come here. I watched you come out of the homes, or I've seen you come, and you're on the verge of divorce, and God has straightened your marriage. We have people that were on the verge of divorce. Now they're helping in our marriage ministry. Figure who that is. We have a number of, of, of that's not one couple. It's, we have all kinds of life groups for the marriage, so it could be anybody. You never know. Quit trying to figure it out. But what am I trying to say? God wants to raise up a powerful, thriving, growing church here. Because how are we going to be a help to international unless we're, we're, we're growing? That's the whole purpose. The reason why we're doing this is because God has given us a mandate. We're called to do this. At this particular time in the history of our church, God is moving us forward into a new season. You know what, what, what's happening in Whittier is we're, we're, we're stepping into a brand new season. This is a new season. This is a new season. That means this is a new season for your life. How many of you could use a new season in your life? How many of you could use a new season in your finances? Huh? How many of you could use a new season in your finances, I said? How many of you want to see some breakthrough with your children, your grandchildren, your marriage? How many need a brand new season? Forget about the past. I'm talking about today is a brand new day. And if God is doing it in the church, that means he's going to do it in your life. You've got to declare it. You've got to say, that's mine. That's for me. I'm declaring a brand new season for my life, my marriage, my children, my finances, for the calling of God upon my life. See, you've got to want it. You've got to want it. You've got to want something. It has to be a passion inside of you. If you just sit there like a dead bump on a log, then how do you expect God to move? God is moved when he sees your anticipation and your expectancy. I know we're in a new season. So, Victor R.H. Woody, we got to get ready to meet the growth that God's going to bring us, and he is bringing us. We got to get ready. We don't just need faithful leaders, we need fruitful leaders. Faithfulness is good for a short season, but then God wants you to shift gears and become fruitful. Our driving passion in life is to please God. Our driving passion in life is to fulfill God's will for our lives. That includes the church. I remember sitting there pretty saved and God gave me this scripture and it's been tattooed in my heart. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I want to share it with you. Paul the Apostle speaking to the church at Corinth. You know, the, remember Corinth, the fleshly church? And he says, my dear brother, stand firm. I love that. Stand firm, man. Let nothing move you. Come on, no matter what storm you go through, in this next season, we need you to be faithful. We need you to be fruitful. We need you to be a giver of your time, your talent, and your finances. We need you to be able to understand the season that we're in and help us build. Are you ready to help us build? I'm asking you, are you ready? Are you ready, Woodier? We got to keep growing. You got to bring people. Each one reach one. Each one keep one. And we're going to have to do three services. Ooh, did I say that? Strike that from the right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sound firm, let nothing move. You always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know your labor is not in vain. God hasn't called us to survive. He's called us to thrive. 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 See, we've got to have vision. This is vision. I heard Pastor's heart. We all heard it. Remember we were talking about it with the, the ministers? As a matter of fact, we wanted to have a sledgehammer party. And Ben was instigating it. And Pastor Chris, he's, he's analytical. And, 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 and uh, he's saying, well, hold on, there's wires there. You're going to short out the whole building. Because Ben was saying, go grab, you heard Pastor. Hey, Pastor Sonny, when he came, hey, go, go, go grab a sledgehammer. Hey, Chris, oh, hold it, hold it, don't grab no sledge. No, grab the sledgehammer. So the analyticals were saying, wait a minute, we got to see where the wires are. And then some of the others were saying, no, 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 kick it, put your foot through the wall. 
ball, punch it, do something. Well, they did it. They did it. We did it. And now we're here because God wants to do something more in our church and in our lives. Amen. When you capture his vision for your life, you become passionate. You become passionate. Who's going to follow a dead, passionate leader? You got to have passion. Have passion for your marriage. And that's a single person saying that. Amen. <laughs> Come on, girl. <laughs> Come on, married people. Have some passion for your marriage. Come on, those that got families, have some passion for your children, for your grandchildren, for you. Those of you that feel the calling of God on your life, have some passion for your ministry, your calling. Passion. Passion is deeper than an emotion. It's deeper. You say, oh, that's just an emotion. There he goes. Well, I've been going there for 36 years. Come on, somebody. And we're just getting started. See, vision determines our future. Failing to see the future means you're failing to seize the future. You got to see it to seize it. Sometimes you got to see it before you can be it. Focusing on our future is so important. Now I want to talk to some people and getting ready to close real soon. Focusing on our future is so important. That's not to say the past isn't important. It has some value. We've learned from our mistakes. How many of you have ever said to yourself, man, if I could do it all over again? Well, no, no, watch this. Watch this. How many of you have ever said that? If I could just go back in time, I would do this and this and that. There. Anybody here wave at me? Huh? Is there some mistakes that you could undo? Huh? Of course there is. So past has value. But if you're always looking back, how are you going to press forward into God's best for your life? Just use your past to be able to give you some insight and wisdom for your future. But don't keep looking back. There's some people that never can go forward because they're always looking in their past. The only one that remembers your past is the devil. And who cares what he thinks anyways? Because today's a brand new day. Today's a brand new season. It doesn't matter what victories you had in the past, what failures you had in the past. God's calling us without repentance. God has a great plan for your life. There's a calling on your life. Rise up today and take your place in this army and help us build. Are you hearing me? The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, you know the scripture, forgetting what is behind. Focus on what is ahead. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Forget, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, look, behold, that's the word in Hebrew. I'm trying to do a brand new thing. See, God's doing a brand new thing. I know this is going to be the best year of my life. Anybody here need a best year of your life? Anybody here need a breakthrough? Anybody here need some financial miracles? Anybody here need a, a touch from God? I don't know about you, but I'm still in the year. My year of Jubilee is going to last for the next 10 years. Can I get a witness? See, the reason why we're doing this is because we have vision. Vision is stretching and growing. Vision is stepping out in faith. Vision is about believing God for the impossible. Vision is about deep down inside of you, understanding that God has called you to accomplish great things for his kingdom and for your life. Vision is about reaching the unsaved all around us. We just came back from Israel, and I'm going to get ready to close right now. I know I said that already, but this time I'm serious. We just came back from Israel. And uh, we got to see Simon Peter's house. We actually seen the ruins of his house. And uh, that's where Jesus healed his mother-in-law, remember? And um, right as you walk away was the synagogue close to Peter's house. And then the area where the woman pressed in with the issue of blood. Remember, she pressed in and she reached for his. We walked that very spot. 
And so can we stop recording right now, please? So when everybody walked away, I was admiring Peter's house. And I stopped recording this. Pastor, I'm just joking right now. Don't get mad at me. So I was looking around. You know, kind of like the old days. So the whole tour was going, and everyone went. They went and other, and I was right there. And I said, you know, this, this wall, this little fence right here, this is not meant to keep people out. This is a challenge. <laughs> so I peeked over, and I seen a rock right there. And let's just say I got a rock from Peter's house. Amen. I'm going to have Pastor, I'm putting the date, and I'm going to have Pastor Sonny sign all my rocks. I got about 20 rocks, Pastor. Amen. <laughs> I, I repented on the flight back. Lord, please don't let this plane crash. But just in case, I ask you. No. But it was in that spot where Jesus, because it was by the Sea of Capernaum, and he was talking with, C, with Simon, and Jesus turned to Simon and he said, this is the exact words in the Greek. He said, you're Simon. Simon means in the Greek, because the New Testament is written in Greek predominantly. It means a reed, easily moved. So that means he was telling Simon, he said, you've been an emotional man your whole life. Every time you get angry, you respond. Every time you get jealous, you respond. A reed shake. Every time there's something that frustrates you or something you don't like or some emotion is stirred up inside of your life, it's caused some cause and effect in your life. And you've gone around and you're always speaking when you shouldn't because you have emotion or you're dealing with situations out of emotion. He said, but now, but from now on, you won't be called Simon anymore after I work with you, after you let me work in your life. And Jesus is saying that today. You will be called Peter, a solid piece of the rock. And that's what vision does to us. It takes the wishy-washy, uncommitted, spineless Christians and turns them into a warrior, a man of God, a woman of God that says, I'm here. This is my church. Come on, say this is my church. How many of you say this is your church? I said, how many of you say this is my church? I want you to say this is my church. I want you to say I love my church. God planted me here. Woo. God is raising up an army. Not emotional people. Not emotional givers. Not emotional attendees. And all of a sudden you go to some, some trial and you say, I'm, I'm staying home until I ain't going to that church. Somebody didn't smile at me. Don't make us go to your house and slap you. God's raising up some Peters. And in closing, the famous artist, I've seen his work when we were in Italy. We were at the Vatican, and we've seen all of the works. His name was Michelangelo. One day when he was there in Italy, he was standing in front of a large piece of rock. With his hammer and his chisel in his hand, he was in the beginning stages of sculpting this big chunk of rock. People were walking by. Somebody close to him said, why are, uh, Angelo, why, why are you wasting your time working on that ugly piece of rock? And Michelangelo turned and he said to the man, his friend, it's not an ugly rock. I see a beautiful angel trapped in this rock, and I'm doing my best to let him out. See, that's what God's doing in Whittier. He's chiseling away. He's molding and shaping men and women for the future. And you're part of it. So the chiseling might be a little uncomfortable. It might be a little painful, but it's the work of the Lord because he's raising up an army. Are you part of this army? 
Are you ready to take your place in this army? Are you ready? Are you ready to be a good steward of your time, your talent, and your money? Are you ready? Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Let's do this for God's glory and God's honor. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Come on, just begin to pray in the spirit. Just begin to pray. Come on, just begin to pray. The gifts and the calling are without repentance. God is calling some of you back. God is placing some of you in this army. God wants to use you. He wants to expand and stretch your faith. He wants to expand your capacity. He wants, to, he wants to do a great thing, a new thing. We're going into a brand new season. A season of breakthroughs and miracles. What's happening in the church is going to happen in our lives, our homes, our marriages, our unsaved loved ones, our grandchildren, our children, our friends, our co-workers. God is raising up an army, an army, an army, an army to fulfill the calling of God, an army to help our pastors, an army that will respond, men and women to go to the missionary field, men and women to take cities, men and women to help build a strong base. God is calling. Do you hear his voice? God is calling. 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 Everybody is praying. Hallelujah. Come on, Christian, just begin to pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to open the altars for those of you that you feel the calling of God on your life. Young people or old, it does not matter. I want to make a special altar call. We'll join those that are here. For those of you that feel a calling of God upon your life, as we sing a song, come on, let's sing a song. I want you to get out of your seats. And I want you to come to this song and say, Lord, use my life for whatever you have for me. I, I, I want to do whatever it is. It doesn't mean that, that to go out. It could go out or maybe just whatever to do something for God. You feel the call of God. Let your oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, yes. God wants to raise up an army. Let your anointing 
fall upon me and fill me with your spirit. Here I am, oh God. Here I am. Ready and willing. Here I am. Use me today. Fall upon me, fill me with your spirit, fill me up, God, fill me up, God, fill me up, God, fill me up, fill me up, God. Oh, there's the presence of the Lord is in this place. Come on, just lift your hands. The presence of God. God is calling people. God is separating men and women for the work of the ministry. God is touching people. There's a brand new season coming upon some that are here upon your ministries, upon your family, upon your finances, upon your life. Oh, hallelujah. God hasn't forgotten you. It's not over. The latter end will be greater than the former. The latter end will be greater than the former. Your blessed days are not behind you. Your anointed and best days are still up ahead of you. Come on. Hallelujah. Worship him all over this place. Come on, all over this place. God is raising up an army. Let's see his Hallelujah. Come on, just Fill worship him. We're gonna end it like the words of this.
Father, now seal it in our hearts, oh God. And thank you for the privilege to serve you and live for you. Thank you for the army that you're raising up for your glory and your honor, oh God. Speak to the men as we go to the mighty men of valor. Speak to the women, God. We thank you for what you're doing, God. We love you, Lord. We love you. We love you. We're nothing without you. Our dependency is on you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What a beautiful presence of the Lord in this place. Beautiful. This is a house of restoration. Holy Ghost Hospital and Holy Ghost University. Brand new beginning. Brand new beginning. Once again, I want to thank all the pastors that have come. It's great to, to have you guys here. We had, we mentioned Pastor Anthony from Manchester and Pastor Toby and his wife Beverly from the heart of the bay. Mike from the international church there. Pastor Jerry from Rotterdam. And Pastor Felix and then Hague. Pastor Morales. I've grown to love these guys because we've been going over there to Europe to see the revival taking place there. And, and uh, we're going to be going again in a few weeks. Pastor Sonny's going to be going and, and ministering and speaking and... Uh, I'm just excited what God's doing over there. And everybody that's come, I know Johnny and his wife have come from San Jose and everybody, especially the presence of the Lord that is in our house. I'm just so broken. I want to thank God for my pastor, for Pastor Sonny, Sister Julie, their input in my life. I am where I am today because of I've learned how to be a man, a husband, a man of God, a pastor because of seen his exampleship and seen her exampleship and it's helped me to be able to change I'm forever grateful I'm grateful I love my pastor amen I love my pastor and I'm grateful and I want to thank my pastor for his he goes out of his way to come here he could be anywhere in the world he's come here to Whittier we, sh we should have gratitude and recognize that we're in the presence of greatness Sister Julie and Pastor, we love you guys so much. Thank you, you know. And I'm always asking him, like, for input. Like, help me. I don't know. Like, I've never been this way before. I don't know how to get to where we need to go. I don't. I, I, I have no point of reference. Except for I have his input. In my, and I thank you, Pastor. Thank you and I love you, man. Love you guys. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Don't forget about tonight. We have uh, all the way from Pretoria, the capital, South Africa, and uh, visiting pastors will be here. Pastor Louie will be ministering. Bring somebody out. We're going to have a pre-conference service tonight. God bless you. We love you. Amen. Stick around. Say hi to the pastors that are here. Fellowship. We'll see you tonight. Amen. God bless you. We love you.